Have you ready? All right. So this is going to be. There are going to be some questions in here about ovarian cancer, so you'll have to gulp your food down to respond. Um, Laura, I'm one of the uh, GYN oncologists here, and um, we tend to do this, I think, every other year. So I don't know how many of you. How many years is your fellowship? Three years. Some of you maybe were here, and I know some of you clinic and things like that too. Occasionally, I, some of you rotated with Burchuk, right? Come through with Burchuk, yeah. And then I know I worked with you once, yeah. So, all right. Well, we're going to talk about ovarian cancer today. Um, I, I tried to incorporate some questions that I had from the last time I gave the talk that I got from your book, some book of questions you had, and then um, there's a couple of other questions that we came up with from an ASCO review that um, Angela Secord and I did last year. So there's some questions pertaining to the last ASCO meeting. Okay, so ovarian cancer. This picture is not what you want to really look at while you're eating. Um, that's an omental cake and the transverse colon, and that's just a total picture of what we would see when we open up someone with advanced ovarian cancer. So the majority, unfortunately, are at advanced stage when they're diagnosed, and it's about 22,000 cases a year. Um, ovarian cancer is tied for eighth among uh, women's cancers in terms of incidence. Of course, the mortality is higher because of the high uh, disease stage when people are diagnosed. So fifth for uh, mortality among women. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you look at the context of phase three trials that have been done over the past 30 years, um, there has been an improvement over time in the overall survival of women with this cancer. So we have two columns here, one is optimal and one is suboptimal, and this is just ranges for overall survival in months, um, optimal means that you've removed, you know, almost all of the disease or all of the disease that you can see down to less than one centimeter nodules. Suboptimal means that you've left behind nodules that are one centimeter or greater in size. That definition has changed somewhat over the years, but then each row is kind of a different era in terms of the chemo that was available. And um, as you can see, the, the survival rates have really increased over time um, in both categories, but most particularly in the optimal category. We know we, the reason we categorize women optimal and suboptimal is that we know optimal debulking is associated with survival advantage. And so treatments are evolving for each of these subgroups as opposed to just lumping everyone together. So despite the fact that we've seen increases in survival, um, when you look at the, the cancer death rate um, from the American Cancer Society, you know, you'll see that the cancers that have really good proven screening protocols like breast, colon, um, these have had reduced mortality. But unfortunately, ovarian cancer, which I think is the orange line, really has overall remained fairly stable and, and mortality has not plummeted, although it's dropped a little bit in the last, let's just say, 10 years. To briefly say that the majority of this talk of what we're going to talk about with the trials and things with the chemo is going to be about epithelial ovarian cancer, and that's the majority of ovarian cancer. So when we're talking about postmenopausal women, woman ovarian cancer, I'm really talking about epithelial ovarian cancer. Um, that's 85% of the cancers. You know, we traditionally thought that they all came from the cell layer that, you know, is on the outside of the ovary. But over the last 10 years, we've also recognized that a lot of the serous cancers are actually coming from the fallopian tube. So um, genetically speaking, fallopian tube cancers look just like what we would also define as high-grade serous ovarian cancers. Um, and in fact, biologists have figured out that they're probably the same thing. So a lot of what we call high-grade serous ovarian cancer, we're really saying serous ovarian or fallopian tube cancer. The other um, subtypes are mucinous. The main ones are mucinous endometrioid and clear cell. These are all a little bit genetically different, and they don't necessarily respond to chemotherapy as well, but they also tend to be at least for mucinous and endometrioid, they tend to be usually maybe, if you're lucky, earlier stage and a little bit more indolent. So they grow slower, but they don't respond to chemo as well. Uh, but what we're mostly going to be thinking about here today is the serous high-grade cancer, which is the most common form of ovarian cancer. The other two major categories of ovarian cancer are germ cell tumors, which those are the ones that you'll often see in the young women, like immature teratoma, dysgerminoma, and adermal sinus tumors. Um, and then the sex cord stromal tumor, that's the classification that includes granulosa cell tumors. 
and they're the ones that make estrogen. So I'm not going to be talking as much about those today, but there was a question, and we'll have it at the end if we can get to it, that came from your book about um, a germ tumor. Um, in terms of epithelial ovarian cancers, um, it's the most common form. Some of them are this thing called a borderline tumor. Okay, so that's not strictly an invasive cancer. It's usually managed surgically, and it does not respond to chemo. It's kind of like almost in the same category as a low-grade like a low-grade serous cancer and a borderline tumor are not that far from each other. Um, but we're not really going to talk about that too much today other than to say a borderline tumor is a little bit of a different um, entity and these are not cancers that are generally treated with chemotherapy. Okay, They're mostly a surgical treatment. They sometimes rarely recur as an invasive cancer and that's, in that case they would usually recur as a low-grade invasive cancer. And if that happens, then you would potentially treat them with chemo, but there are other things that we are trying to look at, look at using. Um, we won't go into that too much. What's borderline about them? So borderline, so there's no, yeah, so there's no invasive component under the microscope. There's tufting and piling up of the epithelial layers. There's nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, you know, that, all that stuff is, there's atypia, you know, but there isn't strictly invasion. Um, and sometimes they'll, there will be a borderline tumor with invasive implants, which is even stranger. So the, ma the main tumor is borderline. They don't see anything invasive, but there'll be like omental disease that invasive implants. So to me, that's I would treat that as an invasive cancer if there's anything that's invasive. But there's all these other subgroups that I hope you don't need to know about, like micropapillary and you just subcategories of borderline tumors that possibly put them at a higher risk of recurring as an invasive cancer. Right, this was a, a question from one of your tests, I think, or something. Um, Forty-eight-year-old woman complains of a pelvic pain. Transvaginal sonogram shows a cystic and solid complex mass in the left ovary. She undergoes laparoscopic LSO, um, laparoscopic left self-injoophorectomy. Her pathology shows a grade two serous ovarian carcinoma. The surface is not involved by the tumor. So it looks like a water balloon and they took it out. Your recommendation for management is A, treatment treatment, B, surgical exploration and complete staging, C, intravenous paclitaxel plus carboplatin, or D, adjuvant pelvic radiation with concurrent cisplatin. B. B. Okay, that's correct. Okay, so how do we stage ovarian cancer? So we just want to just take the tumor out. We, have, we want to do some different things. So we'll talk about what the staging is. So a stage 1A or 1B is basically confined to the ovaries. 1C consists of either positive washings, which means you put some saline in there, you swish it around, you pull it out, and are there cancer cells there? Excrescences means that there's, there's stuff that looks like cancer on the outside of it. So it's not a simple water balloon. There's stuff that looks like it's growing out of it, right? Tufts and funny things. And then there's rupture. If, the, if you got in there and the thing was leaking, or you ruptured it, technically that counts as a stage 1C cancer. Okay, stage 2 is anything confined to the pelvis. So if it's stuck to the pelvic sidewall and you did a biopsy of the pelvic peritoneum and that was positive, that's stage 2. Um, you know, uterus, two that's involved, that's a stage 2. Stage 2C is the same thing with the washings or the rupture. Then we get into stage 3. 3 is really abdomen and 4 is distance. So within abdominal disease, there's microscopic, which is stage A, and then there's macroscopic, which is 3B and 3C. Macroscopic can be less than 2 centimeter not implants or nodules, for instance, on the omentum or on the diaphragm, um, or greater than 2 centimeters, and that's the difference between B and C. Nodal metastases, so pelvic nodes, aortic nodes, those also are considered stage 3C. If you have parenchymal liver mets, that's stage 4. Plural of stage four, you know, obviously brain meds or something like that, stage four. Now, if you take a patient with the simple water balloon on their ovary and you go and take their ovary out and everything else looks fine, you know, what percentage of the time would these other areas be positive? And so this is the answer. So washings are going to be positive 10 to 15 percent of the time, momentum 10 to 15, you know, upper abdominal biopsies. So you'll take, you know, peritoneum from you know, kind of next to the colon on each side, that's called the paracolic gutter. 
Um, you can take a pap smear of the diaphragm or a biopsy of the diaphragm. If you take all these, and, you, and the omentum, if you take all of these things, you know, these are the percentage of the time that you're actually going to find cancer in those areas. And so overall, the chance of upstaging is around a third, okay? So that's why the answer to that question was B and not just do nothing or, um, or give her chemo. Because, you know, some of these people potentially may not need to have chemotherapy. So it's always a judgment call. If they're sick, if they're old, you know, you want to get them off the table. I'm going to patient chemo anyway because of this reason. It's already ruptured or there's this reason that it's so, it looks really aggressive or something and I think I would treat her anyway and maybe I don't care if I know the full staging. But the right answer is B, do the full staging. Do the full staging, is that all, is that what it is? All of those things you yes. listed there? Yes, yes. So pelvic washing, so mental, you remove the omentum or, or most of it, depending on, you know, pretty much all of it. Um, biopsies of the pelvic peritoneum, the bladder peritoneum, posterior cul-de-sac, pericolic gutter, tapsure or some assessment of the diaphragm, that's basically it, and then the aortic and pelvic nodes. So, add time to the surgical procedure and it can add it. So, next question. 47-year-old woman complains of persistent pelvic pressure and bloating. A transvaginal sonogram shows a complex red nectal mass. A CT scan shows no other abnormalities. She undergoes THBSO, complete surgical staging. Let's just see had all those things we just mentioned. The pathology shows a grade one endometrioid adenocarcinoma of the right ovary. The ovarian surface is not involved by the tumor. The left ovary, both fallopian tubes, uterus, lymph nodes, washings, and all biopsies are negative for cancer. What's your recommendation? So first of all, what stage is she? Everything was negative except the ovary. It's a 1A. Mm -hmm. So it's a 1A grade 1 endometrioid cancer of the ovary. And so you want to do no treatment, I carbotaxol, IP chemo, vaginal brachytherapy. Don't ever a lot of a. a. It's A. So it's A. So the only people that really don't get chemo anymore for sure are the A or 1B. Really want one. Grade 2 is kind of iffy, and grade 3s are definitely going to get chemo. So this is the, like, the lowest risk invasive cancer. They're giving it to you, and you're going to say no treatment. But kind of anyone in that grade 3 rupture, you know, other than that, those people are going to get chemo, and there's data for that. So treatment for early ovarian cancer, the low risks are the stage 1A and 1B, grade 1. Those people have a greater than 90% survival with no further therapy. Um, and then if you've got young patients, so if there's a question about a patient that wants to retain fertility, then the correct answer is to leave the other ovary in, and you can leave the uterus in, but do all the rest of the staging. While the rest of the staging is negative, you could still potentially, you know, withhold chemotherapy, and they would retain their fertility. Okay. Um, and then decide later whether you want to take the other ovary out. Um, usually, I would surveillance them. You know, if they've had ovarian cancer, I would get ultrasounds of the other ovary as part of their surveillance. And then at some point, you know, either they're at the age where they don't have any more kids and they want the ovary out, or maybe they don't have any more kids, but it's already been eight or ten years and the chance of it coming back is pretty low, so you wouldn't necessarily have to go back and take the other ovary out at that point. Um, anything, I told you the stuff on the bottom. The bottom line is um, anything higher than the lowest risk will end up getting chemo. And many of those patients will get six cycles, but in particular, there's a, a study at three versus six cycles of chemo for those early stage by risk patients. They showed that six that three and six were basically equivalent. There wasn't a difference, but they did a subgroup analysis unplanned on the serous patients, and the serous patients, it looked like, did benefit from the six cycles. So we, at least here at Duke, always treat serous cancers that are early stage but high risk with six cycles of chemo. If we were going to give chemo to other early stage high risk patients, we would potentially give three, like endometrioid, mucinous, you know, these ones that are less virulent and also don't respond as well to chemo. Um, for this cancer, you're going to take both of the ovaries out. You're probably going to take the uterus out. Um, you know, usually there's some risk of the cancer being on the uterine surface, um, on the serosa, since it's sitting right there next to it. 
um, omentum, resect intraperitoneal metastases uh, that are greater than a centimeter. You really want to resect to no disease, but if you can get them to be too optimal, which is less than one centimeter nodules, that's preferable. Um, and if you have to do other intra-abdominal procedures to accomplish the debulking, then you would do that. Um, and the kind of general number for being able to do an optimal debulking is around 60%. Um, and this does improve the median survival after chemo, chemo by up to, you know, 12 to 24 months. So it's very um, to try to get them to bulk. Uh, okay, so then here's a question. Of, there's a question about, you know, can you just start the patient on chemo without doing surgery? So there's primary surgical debulking. That's always been kind of the standard. And then there's this neoadjuvant chemo where you start them with the chemo and then you debulk them maybe halfway through after three cycles go back to bulk them, and then go back and give more chemo after that. This tends to be an alternative strategy for women who maybe you have assessed as debulking isn't going to be likely to be optimal. So maybe they've got liver mets, maybe they have known like pleural disease, I mean they have stage 4 disease, or they just have what looks on CT like really difficult to resect stage 3 disease the patients who potentially are going to be neoadjuvant candidates. And the justification for that is this study, which is uh, a European study that randomized women with biopsy-proven stage 3C or 4 ovarian cancer to either neoadjuvant chemo with full debulking or primary debulking um, by six cycles of adjuvant. And as you can see, there is no difference in overall survival between the two groups. Um, so folks in this country who, you know, heard about the study, had problems with it, the main problem being that the overall survival was just significantly lower than um, similar stage three to four trials that were done in this country. And so the idea was, what was this, you know, there was probably some selection bias for this trial where they were picking patients who already were maybe, you know, candidates for neoadjuvant or had a bad prognosis up front. And this is the main argument for why it's not a standard in this country to just give everyone chemo up front. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, the surgery will be easier after you give three cycles of chemo in most cases. It will be less blood loss. It will be easier recovery. There may be fewer bowel resections and more radical procedures. But in our heart of hearts, most UIN oncologists do not um, believe that it's actually better for the patient. I mean, we know there's hard data saying that um, debulking is important. And, you know, when you're debulking someone after three cycles of chemo, even if you get them optimal, you know, I personally have a real warm and fuzzy feeling like I've really cured this patient like I do when I'm doing that in the primary setting. And um, I've just seen enough patients that have recurred quickly after what I would consider an optimal debulking following the adjuvant treatment. So I don't think it's the same. I mean, in this study, they did show that debulking to optimal was prognostic whether it was done up front or whether it was done as an interval procedure. But right now, there's people in this country that are really kind of fighting to do this study again in our population, in an art, the setting of GYN oncology in, in this country. And it's, it's problematic as to whether it will get funded to do the study. But that said, new adjuvant is an option. I don't know how much you're going to see on your um, test about that, but I would just say think about it for high risk patients if it comes up in a question. Patients who you don't think you could debulk. Or the other ones that we offer and we'll pick this for is like really sick, had a stroke, had a PE, just got diagnosed with an, a DVT, you don't want to put a filter in them, you know, give them three cycles of chemo, seeing how well their performance status will improve and then do the surgery. And we do that much more commonly for, you know, for, me, for more medical reasons than really for, you know, the reason of, I don't know if I can remove all this disease. Okay, next question. Um, I'm sorry. In yeah. I think it was carbotaxol. Does it say here? It doesn't. I don't really know. These, these, a lot of these URTC studies, there is a mixed bag, so I couldn't tell you without going back and looking at it. But it, I'm sure that it, what I am sure is it was platinum based. Can I promise you that they were all carbotaxol? No. But a lot of times they'll just specify platinum based in some of these you know, European studies, and it will be a mixed bag. All right, so. Debulking doesn't apply to if they have like long mass or anything like that, and you don't take those off. Well, no, I mean, for the most part, no. But there are some places, like, you know, really ag aggressive places like Sloan Kettering, where they will be like calling in the lung surgeons and like doing VATS procedures at the same time as primary. It's not completely. 
of the questions, but the more you do, the more compartments you invade with your surgery. I mean, those are particularly much longer recoveries and, and more morbid procedures. So, uh, no, I don't generally call a lung surgeon, you know, be a patient that I might start with chemo, you know. Okay. 58-year-old woman presents with increased bone growth, bloating, and pain. A CT scan shows a cytes and a mental cake. No parenchymal liver mets, and there is no pleural effusion. Her CA125 is 479. The patient undergoes TAHBSO, complete optimal debulking. At the end of the surgery, there is no grossly visible residual disease. Which of the following treatment options uh, provides overall survival advantage for this patient compared with IV carbotaxol? A, IV carbo plus taxol plus gemcitabine. B, IP cisplatin plus IP and IV taxol. C, high-dose carbo, followed by autologous stem cell transplant. D, IP carbo plus intraperitoneal taxol. B. B, that's correct. Okay, GOG-172, there were three kind of key trials that showed that IP chemo for optimally debulked ovarian cancer is superior, but this is the last one and very well publicized back in, I don't know, 2000. It was sometime after 2005, maybe 2007. So um, stage 3 ovarian cancer with no residual tumor greater than 1 centimeter, randomized to IP taxol, <coughs> I'm sorry, IV taxol and IP cisplatin on the first two days. And then the following week they get IP taxol. And the other arm was IV cis and IV taxol because at that time IV cisplatin was standard and the study that proved carbo was equivalent to cis for ovarian cancer cancer hadn't been completed yet. So overall survival curve, um, and it is significant. And the difference in uh, overall survival between groups was 66 months for the IP group and 49 months for the IV group. So it was a very significant difference in overall survival. Um, most interesting, uh, well, okay, the one caveat to this data is that um, there's a lot higher toxicity in the IP arm. So you've got to think about that when you're deciding. Um, the, there was a 45% grade 3 to 4 toxicity in the IP arm versus 24% for the IV arm. So you really have to think and pick and choose who you're going to, to put on this kind of therapy. And in fact, if you looked at the IP arm, only I think 42% of the patients in the IP arm got all six recommended cycles of treatment. So it's hard to get through all of the IP. But I guess with that said, you could put it the other way and say, you may only get four cycles, but you still have a survival advantage, you know, even if we can only give you four cycles and we have to switch you to IV. So um, this, is, this is data. I think the most concerning thing about this kind of data and the thing that keeps getting brought up at meetings like ASCO, Dr. Armstrong spoke at ASCO this year about this, um, aren't using it as much as they probably should. I mean, this is really the standard of care for optimally developed ovarian cancer. And, you know, it is a little bit technically more cumbersome um, because you've got to put the IP catheter in. And if you didn't put it in at the time of the original debulking, they're going to have to go back to have that put in. And that's a different, that's another to the OR. There were a significant number of catheter types of complications at first in this trial, but I think a lot of the centers that do that did enroll a lot on the trial kind of worked through those and, you know, I mean, we give a decent amount of IP chemo and we don't have a lot of trouble with with this the way I think we did and a lot of people did at the beginning. So once you get your processes in place, uh, it's better. And I would also say that the nurses in the treatment room get used to it. I mean, at first, when we started giving this in Raleigh, they were freaked out because never given IP chemo, you know. But then now that's like, I'm not going to say they love it. I mean, it does require a little bit more intensity of nursing care, but it's not that horrible. You know, we've got we've had a number of patients go through in Raleigh with it, and they, they've done well with it. And we troubleshoot when we have to troubleshoot. Um, so this should be really the standard optimally developed ovarian cancer. Um, but the other treatment choice is the 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 regimen that was kind of shown to be equivalent to IV cis taxol, which is IV carbotaxol. Next question. Okay, so this was the question. I just put a little red star by the answer. Okay. How soon after their surgery is complete do you start? Two to four weeks after? Yeah, like I usually tell them three weeks. <coughs> I usually tell the patient about three weeks because I think they have time to recover, but I don't want 
we have enough time that the cat is going to start to grow again. So in my mind, it's two weeks would probably be the earliest, and I tell them not to go more than much more than a month. So, yeah. All right, here's one from the ASCO update that we did in June, or I mean, I guess we did this in August. I don't know. 65-year-old woman presented with progressive abdominal distension and was found to have massive ascites. She underwent suboptimal debulking of a stage 3C serous ovarian cancer. Her performance status is excellent. The chemo regimen most proven to maximize her overall survival <coughs> is number one, taxol on day one. Number two is the IP regimen <coughs> just described uh, from GOG 172. Number three, IV carbo and IP. IV taxol, but you're giving the IV taxol on days 1, 8, and 15, so you're giving it weekly. And number four is IV carbo, IV carbo, and IV fasten on day one and as maintenance for 16 cycles. Opinion about this? All right, so since we don't know, let's talk about some of the studies. Um, GOG 218, this is a, um, that randomized women who had stage 3 optimal uh, or stage 3 suboptimal ovarian cancer or stage 4, so any advanced ovarian cancer, randomized <coughs> to either IV carbotaxol or IV carbotaxol and bezimab. Both of those arms followed by placebo for 16 cycles. And then the third arm, they got carbotaxol and bevacizumab up front for six cycles, and then they got bevacizumab for 16 additional cycles, so as maintenance. And in this study, the two arm that was really considered the winner, the, the primary outcome of this study was PFS. And the arm that was considered the winner was the maximum bevacizumab arm. So the people who got carbotaxol, bevacizumab, plus 16 additional cycles, of bevacizumab had the best progression-free survival. A difference was not huge. It's uh, about three, let's see, 10, three versus 14.1 months. So something like 3.8 months different, okay? There was no overall survival difference, and I, that wasn't one of their primary endpoints, and I don't think they're ever going to demonstrate that. A second trial that was done at the same time and was published in the New England Journal in the same issue is ICON-7. So this is a European trial with a very similar design um, it was advanced. Actually, I think in this trial you didn't have to have advanced cancer. But anyway, it was ovarian cancer. I think it was all stages. Um, so, in this trial, BEV dose was lower. It was half. So the BEV dose was only 7.5. But otherwise, there were two um, groups. One group just got carbotaxol placebo. The other group got carbotaxol BEV, and there was maintenance BEV. <coughs> So the progression-free survival difference was, again, um, shown and was significant, although it was even slightly less of a difference than they showed in 218. Um, interesting thing about this, so there was no overall survival difference, but the interesting thing in this study was that they looked at this high, they did an unplanned subgroup analysis of the, what they called the high-risk women, okay? These are suboptimals and the stage fours. And what they found was, First of all, that the progression-free survival difference was greater within that subgroup. And secondly, that there was an overall survival difference in the high-risk subgroup. So the optimals are the ones, the two lines at the top that are right next to each other. Those are the optimals with and without the BEV. And then the lower two lines are the suboptimals, the people that did not were not optimally debulked or had stage 4 disease. And in this group, the folks that got the bevacizumab had better overall survival. Okay, so that's one piece of data you need to answer the question. Okay, the second piece of data is, the, is going to come from this. This is a Japanese GOG study that also um, did an oral talk at ASCO this year. So this was um, patients with primary ovarian, epithelial ovarian cancer um, who were randomized to either IV carbotaxol in the standard, what we would consider the standard regimen on day one, versus dose-dense taxol on days one, eight, and 15. Okay, so carbo on day one and taxol weekly. I'll, I'll go through that. So progression-free survival was very significantly different in favor of the dose-dense taxol. So dose-dense group, the total dose is 200, <coughs> 240, and 
every three-week taxol group, it's 180. So they're getting more taxol, and they're also getting it weekly. And um, as you can see, they had a very significant finding with progression-free, and this is overall survival. And this was also very significant. So, um, so what this tells us is that uh, dose-dense may actually be a better way for us to be delivering taxol. Uh, people who are the naysayers about this right now are the ones that say this was a Japanese population. We don't really know what's going to happen in a Western population. It needs to be verified and validated in our population. So, um, you know, if you ask someone what's the standard of care for ovarian cancer, most people aren't right now going to say dose dense taxol. But the truth is, there's very good data in, in from Japan showing that dose dense may be the next thing after IP. Um, okay, and then this just shows that they looked at the, the upper two curves uh -huh. are the optimally developed, the lower two curves are the high risk or suboptimally developed, and basically that the overall survival advantage um, was more significant in the high risk group, but that they still saw some separation of the curves in the low risk group. i do this one right now. I didn't talk about consolidation with taxol, but I'll put this in anyway. So GO78 was a study that looked at um, women with advanced ovarian cancer who got a standard six cycles of carbotaxol <coughs> IV, and they, they randomized women to get extra taxol. So half women got three cycles of extra taxol, and half the women got 12 cycles, or a full year of extra taxol. And there was also a big, uh, again, very significant <coughs> difference in progression-free survival in favor of giving a full year of consolidation to Taxol. But I think you guys know that you know, giving an extra year of Taxol has a lot of morbidity with it as well. And so um, most of the people who really looked at the study when it came out, I don't know, 2003, it's been a while, said, I'm sure it's worth it because you're giving, you know, you only have an improvement in progression-free survival of seven months, but you're given 12 months of extra Taxol, and that's a lot of morbidity. So this is not necessarily standard, but it is an option. So if you look at the options for advanced ovarian cancer, um, the two bevacizumab regimens um, really showed an overall survival advantage. There's a progression-free survival advantage that's pretty consistent of a few months. And then in this subgroup analysis, they found that the high-risk patients had this overall survival difference in the ICOM-7 trial. Um, in the and then you've got the the regimen with the dose dense taxol that showed a significant overall survival advantage. Um, and over here on the other side, I've just this is the the kind of consolidation treatments is a progression free survival advantage if you add taxol for an additional 12 months. So to me, I think the one that makes the most sense as giving you the biggest bang for your buck is the dose dense taxol. And so, if I was going to answer this question, I think I would answer it with number three. But this wasn't a question out of your book, so um, definitely in your in your in your test, I would not I wouldn't talk about using IP chemo for, for suboptimally developed patients, right? You're not going to do that. Um, I think what you can say is, you know, what has been proven to show an overall survival advantage most recently for suboptimally developed, and that's number three. That's the dose dense capital, even though it hasn't really been completed in a Western popula population. Um, and beyond that, you can say that there is a subgroup analysis from ICON 7 that shows that the suboptimally developed subgroup may be the ones who actually derive an overall survival advantage from the addition of bevacizumab. But you have to give it both with their pre chemo and as a maintenance uh, for a number of cycles afterwards. Um, just of interest, the next, uh, this is the next. GOG trial that's going to be analyzed. It's completed accrual, um, but it hasn't. Been, there's no results yet. So it's going to answer some questions for us about can we alleviate the toxicity of the um, the GOG 172 intraperitoneal regimen, the one that had the 45% with the grade three to four toxicity. So we've got three different arms here competing. Bottom arm is the reproduction of that IP. Um, from GOG-172, the, the only difference is they've decreased some of the doses a little. So they're trying to make it a little bit less toxic, but it's basically the same regimen, which is IV taxol on day one, IP cisplatin on day two, and IP uh, taxol on day eight. Uh, the other two regimens are looking at dose-dense taxol based on the preliminary results of the Japanese study, 
Um, and then one of them is looking at interperitoneal carboplatin, which we really haven't um, addressed in the GOG yet. And if that one, you know, works as well or better, that could be the new standard. You know, IP carbo and dose dense taxol, that might be the winner, and that would be kind of an exciting thing. And then in this study, everyone got bevacizumab because they had just, I think they had just broken the results of 218. They said, oh, there's a PFS advantage. So everyone in the study got bev. Personally, I'm not convinced that we should be giving beds to our frontline patients with ovarian cancer, and I don't personally use it in that setting. Okay, onward. A 66-year-old. Yes. So, so, but even, so, you still, I mean, you don't answer the question of with the original regimen, you know, with the IP cargo, basically, is it better than the way that was, you know, even, because you couldn't really compare the inner trial toxicity and if they're I not know. really giving you're, you're saying because we didn't use the exact same regimen from 172. I mean, this is the kind of thing that always happens. So there's a lot of arguments in some committee, and everyone decides that the current, the, the original regimen was just too toxic, and we've got to modify it a little bit, and this is what they came up with. So they reduced a couple of the doses, and you're right. It's not going to be, it's never a direct comparison, just like in 172, the IP regimen wasn't compared to IV carbotaxol. It was compared to IV cisplatin taxol, and a lot of people had an issue about that. I mean, there's always going to be these problems in comparison because the, the comparator arm is never the exact same as the last trial. So you're right. We'll have to figure it out. Okay, a 66-year-old presents with recurrent epithelial ovarian cancer. She was diagnosed with suboptimally developed stage 3C ovarian cancer 24 months ago. She was treated with IV carbotaxol for six cycles, and she had a complete clinical response. Her last chemo treatment was 18 months ago. She complains of a persistent peripheral neuropathy that makes it difficult for her to walk more than a block without pain. Is this supposed to make it easier, I guess? What is your recommendation for treatment? Um, a, IV carbo. B, IP cisplatin plus IP and IV taxol. C, IV carbo plus taxol. Or D, IV carbo plus gemcitabine. Okay, so. Um, that's right. Let's, but let's talk about the trials that showed that gemcitabine is a good agent for this group. This group is called platinum sensitive. So if your cancer recurs more than six months after your last chemotherapy cycle, that's platinum sensitive recurrence. So the next few slides will be about platinum sensitive recurrence. Um, so this is a European trial looked at carboplatin versus coplatin and gemcitabine. So prior to, let's just say 2000, the standard for platinum sensitive disease was just to give them a single agent platinum agent next, and patients usually responded to that. And the theory is they're adding additional treatments, doing combination treatments for recurrent disease is, is kind of too toxic and blah, blah, blah. So then there's these studies I'm gonna show you that really proved that there was some benefit. So this study, um, carbo versus carbo gems are patients with platinum sensitive ovarian cancer. And this, again, was not powered for a difference in overall survival. They did demonstrate a significant difference in progression-free survival um, in this population. So there's the OCEAN <coughs> study. The OCEAN study basically built on that AGO-OVAR study, that Euro the other European study. So this is a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled phase three mm -hmm. trial of chemo with or without bevacizumab in patients with platinum-sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer. So um, patients were randomized to carbogem <coughs> versus carbogem bevacizumab. And if you got bevacizumab, or if you got placebo, you would stay on it until you, your progression of your disease. And the PFS analysis is significant. Um, there is a difference in progression-free survival of about four months. Survival at this time does not show a significant difference, but there is a bit of separation of the survival curves. This, this table really says what I know about the treatment of platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer. So I-carbo was kind of the original standard. Um, the first trial that really showed combination treatment <coughs> the superior was really ICON-4, and that was a trial that looked at um, any platinum-based regimen that didn't include taxol versus platinum and taxol. Um, and it funded a whole bunch of different centers in Europe. And they showed a overall survival advantage to adding taxol to platinum in the setting of platinum resistant, I mean, platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer. And this was really the first 
trial that said we really probably should be, if, they are t if, if the patient doesn't have that bad neuropathy, we should be considering retreating the patient with combination therapy when they recur in a platinum-sensitive way. Then these other trials came out. So the, the first one that showed that Carbo and Gemzar was better than Carbo alone. And then this Calypso study. Okay, the Calypso study is a trial that looked at Carbotaxel versus Carbodoxel and, in fact, showed an advantage to Carbodoxel being for progression-free survival compared to Carbotaxel in this setting. So the, and the OCEANS trial that I showed you added BEV to the Carbogemzar uh, regimen. To me, the two ones that I have circled in the red boxes are really what I would consider the winners. Um, but what I would, what I would, I use all of these regimens. I use every single regimen that's on this slide. In other words, patients, you know, isn't going to tolerate combination treatment, but they're platinum sensitive. I'll just give them carbo, no problem. I mean, that's what we used to give everyone, and a lot of people are going to have a complete response to that. Um, Great, you know, neuropathy, I would do Carbogem or Carbodoxel. Either one of those, I think, is, is a good choice. And then if I want to really kind of go the whole hog and the patient wants to take on the additional burden of really being on the BEV and knowing that they're going to have to come back and get that till they progress, I mean, I think that's a burden because a lot of these patients are, you know, potentially going to go back into a remission and be in that remission for over another year. Okay? So the way I'm talking about it now is, you know, we don't have to put you on this. If we put you on this, technically based on the study, you know, you're, you would get most advantage to, from it if you stay on it until you progress. But, I mean, if we're really out a year and you haven't progressed, I mean, we could consider taking you off. I mean, I kind of, I just can't fathom the idea of having to have them be on it forever if they're in this really prolonged remission. So any of the, the things on this slide are good. I think the way they phrased the question, they made it, you know, pretty obvious they didn't want you to pick the tax all, right? So the gem carbo... And then now with the OCEANS data that's been presented at, um, at ASCO this year, you know, you're going to have to have that in, into your algorithm. I don't know how they're going to deal with that with the questions, but have that in the back of your mind as well. But know that the only one that's shown a survival, overall survival advantage is really the ICON-4 study, and that's just plain old carbotaxel against carb plus any other drug that they wanted to give, whether it was single-agent carbo or carbocyclophosphamide or whatever, the carbotaxel one. That was my choice, like you. Okay, here's another one. The 60-year-old woman presented to her PCP with bloating, abdominal discomfort, and dyspnea on exertion and was found to have intra-abdominal carcinomatosis, a pelvic mass, and pleural effusion. She underwent primary debulking of a stage 4 high-grade serous ovarian cancer. She subsequently received six cycles of IV, car IV carbotaxel. Her CA125 dropped from 2,536 down to 20 at the completion of cycle 6. Three months surveillance visit, her CA125 had risen to 138, and a CT revealed right paracolic nodularity and enlarged retroperitoneal nodes. So, most appropriate intervention is <laughs> this isn't a test question, this is one that we made up, so it's not quite as clear cut. Carbo, carbo and liposomal doxorubicin, liposomal doxorubicin, bevacinab. Liposomal doxorubicin and bevacizumab, or palliative care consult and hospice referral. So, who wants to say what they would? Just give me like one or two, because I don't really think there's one right answer here. Five. five. Okay, five. Yep. What else? A good answer. I think six is a good answer. Um, and actually, I think six is a good answer agents that we use for platinum resistance. So she came back for her first three-month visit, right, and she had recurrent disease. So now we're platinum resistant. These people have a bad prognosis. They're not going to do well. What are the rates of response for different single agents that you could treat them with? These are the ones I generally are likely to use. Honestly, I almost never use topo -tecan. And there was actually a, I didn't put it in here, but there was a head-to-head -head trial of topo -tecan versus doxel in this population of doxel-1. Um, I put topotecans, well, we'll mention it on the next slide, but, um, yeah, I don't, a topicide's kind of, the bottom of the barrel for me is a topicide tamoxifen, and um, I'll even do, like, oral cytoxan sometimes. It depends on the performance status and if they're, we really want to keep going with treatment. All right, so here's, um, this was a, presented at ASCO this year. This is the Aurelia trial. 
again, a bevacizumab trial. Um, so they took patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, and they were able to get either Texol weekly, which I actually do use a lot of in this setting, Totecan, which I really don't, but I guess some people do, and then Doxel. Um, and they would either get the chemo or the chemo plus Bev, and again, it's treatment until progression or toxicity. I'll get that. So there was a significant difference in progression-free survival in favor of the bevacizumab arm. So they, you know, really almost doubled the patient's uh, progression-free survival with the addition of bevacizumab. That's what that we're yelling out for number five or whatever it was. The toxicity wasn't necessarily that much worse in the bevacizumab arm. Primary objective, there was a significant improvement in the response rate. But you know, we always talk about GI perforation with bevacizumab, and it was less than or about 2%. I mean, I think that's as fun as we were worried that it would be. I've had a couple of patients who have had, I don't know how much bevacizumab you guys use, but um, I had one lady who had, had like a, an abscess, but they said it was a perf, it was, there was contrast in it, but we put a drain in, she recovered in the hospital, never had to have surgery. I had another patient that had some kind of a, like a rectal fistula, general surgery, took to the OR and just drained it, like a little perirectal abscess thing. I haven't ever had to take someone back to the OR for, for this, so hopefully that's not going to become more common as... I think we're going to be using a little bit more of it. So they are the ones that I, you know, and I use a lot of weekly axol in these patients if they don't have neuropathy or don't have a lot of neuropathy. I, I pick the lipizumal doxorubicin because there's not a lot of toxicity. Um, again, I think adding the BEV is, you can get into questions of cost, and this is it's just, is it really right to be throwing a super expensive drug at people who have a terrible prognosis. So I guess I've got some issues about that. I would much prefer to use this drug in the platinum sensitive population to some extent because those people potentially have a much better overall outlook. And so I wouldn't bring it up with just anyone who has platinum resistant disease for sure. I think, I think you need to be talking about palliative care as soon as someone's coming in with resistant disease, whether or you stop chemo or not. Hospice is a, is a different issue. and. I think if you can start talking about hospice and palliative issues as soon as they start to recur, that's probably the best way to go about it. But that's a whole different talk. The other thing that's kind of on the horizon with, um, you know, with ovarian cancers is the PARP inhibitor trials that have come out um, here lately. And PARP inhibitors are not really on the market, but there have been a couple of PARP trials that were reported at this year at ASCO and last year at ASCO. Um, so both of these trials were in a platinum set population. Um, the tr this trial, which was reported at ASCO this year, they gave the um, alaparib up front with the carbotaxel in this platinum-resistant population, and they continued it until progression. Um, and it, you know, they did that the, the inhibitor group favored, and, and the, there was a significant difference in progression-free survival. Um, in the second study, I won't go into all this. The other study that was reported last year at ASCO, it was anyone who was had either a partial or a complete response to whatever chemo they were given for their platinum sensitive disease, they then either a laparib or placebo at that point, at the point of response. And interestingly, they again showed, you know, this, this also showed a, a significant difference in overall um, I mean, in <coughs> but not in overall survival. So PARP inhibitors are on the horizon. You know, we know that they may work better in people who have BRCA mutations or some kind of BRCA-like defect. And so that's the stuff that's being sorted out right now. And in fact, there's a proposal on the table to include PARP inhibitors in the next GOG trial for suboptimal developed patients up front. And this would be four different arms incorporating parts, either as part of the upfront therapy, as a maintenance regimen, or both. So if this trial gets done, we'll get some more information about whether PARP inhibitors could be part of the next great thing. Okay, here are two questions that were in there that I did part of my talk, but I just thought we should say what the answers to them are. Um, a 52-year-old woman seeks consultation regarding management of her stage 2 epithelial ovarian cancer. She reported her mother had colon cancer at age 55. Her maternal grandmother had endometrial cancer at age 48. 
The patient has two healthy younger sisters and two daughters. In addition to discussing adjuvant treatments for stage two ovarian cancer, you recommend A, ERCA testing, B, take out your colon, <coughs> C, IHC for mismatch repair, um, and genetic counseling regarding HNPCC types of mutations, and D is prophylactic mastectomy. So, yeah. So, so I think that one's pretty obvious about Lynch syndrome, and I just wanted to point it out there. Um, we think about that more with women that have uterine cancer because the risk of uterine cancer is higher in Lynch in HPCC than the risk of ovarian cancer. Um, but you may have a question like that. Okay. Uh, the next one is about a non-epithelial cancer. So it's a 33-year-old who had a right at nexal mass. Her ovary was removed, and they found um, a three immature, or I'm sorry, a grade three immature teratoma of the right ovary. They didn't see anything outside of the ovary, and the question is, um, do you want to take her other ovary out? She's 33. It doesn't say if she's had kids or not, so let's just, I'm kind of assuming she didn't, but um, do you want to go back, take the other ovary out, and do a full staging? Do you want to give her platinum and radiation, platinotoposide based chemo or observation? Any ideas? I think the answer is C. Um, and the reason is that basically any of these, any germ cell tumors or granulosis cell tumors, if you're going to give them chemo, the standard is really platinum and etoposide. Beth, like the uh, bleo, etoposide platinum, or just etoposide platinum. So just keep that in mind. And then with these younger patients, I mean, she's not that young, but she's, you wouldn't automatically just take the other ovary out. And I think staging is also a little bit more like to, sh to give you good information in these germ cell tumors than in epithelial cancers. So, to me, the most the one that makes the most sense is B, which is platinum and I mean I'm sorry C, platinum and etoposide. Any questions? If they have like a remission and they relapse by scan, do you usually rebiopsy? Like if it's aortic nodes or something like that. Right. It really depends on the patient, you know. It, I don't. I don't automatically rebiopsy. I mean, if it's like really obvious, everything's really obvious. The CA125 is going up, and they're recurring in a pattern that's very consistent with recurrent disease. No, I don't insist that they have a, a biopsy done. Um, if there's any question, or just depending on the patient. I mean, it's more of a patient, you know, kind of based thing, individualized. Um, if, if I'm going to put them on a protocol or something and it, it requires it, you know, I mean, we do have a lot of trials for these patients too. So, no, I don't automatically require that anyone with recurrence have a biopsy to be treated. Yep. What, what kind of image do you use in surveillance? Is it CT or ultrasound or? I should have really done something about that. So, um, so, so, interestingly, so this trial. Um, heard of the Rustin criteria? Rustin is this guy who invented the kind of the alternative to the rhesus criteria for, for ovarian cancer. So the it kind of criteria about how much the CA125 would have to drop to call something a response. So the same guy, he's English, did this trial looking at surveillance. And so they randomized women with advanced ovarian cancer to either uh, knowing the CA125 or not knowing it when they were being followed. And so at CA125 is drawn every three months. But in one group, nobody got to look at the result. Not the patient, not the doctor, nobody. In the other group, the doctor got to look at it, and they would use that to just, as well as the physical exam and da-da-da, to decide what to do. Nobody had scans mandated. But as you might expect, the people who had the CA-125s, you know, had more scans. And so the outcomes were survival and quality of life. So what do you think was the result? No difference. <laughs> huh? No difference? Or? No difference in overall survival and the quality of life was lower in the group that had the CA-125s and knew about them. Okay, so you could argue that these people don't need anything. In fact, this Rustin guy gets up in front of everyone and says that he doesn't, all he does is goodbye, you're done with your chemo, you know, come back and see me or go to your primary care doctor if you have any symptoms. These are the symptoms of recurrent ovarian cancer. Goodbye. <coughs> but that's not really how we do things here, and here isn't necessarily right, right? It's more expensive, but it's not necessarily right. But so what I do, if CA125 was elevated when they were diagnosed, I get CA125s every three months, and I follow them with, a pelvic, with an exam. You know what I mean? Um, if 
they didn't have an elevated CA125, there's kind of two things you could do. Okay, one is you could get an HE4, which is another FDA-approved marker that can be used for um, following ovarian cancer. And, you know, that would be a, just a, another piece of information that you would have. And the other one would be to get scans. So um, they've had no, you know, this 25 was either not elevated or it was like 50. It wasn't very high at all, you know. I may get CTs for sure. I might every six and then space it out a couple of years to once a year, you know. But that's not necessarily right. That's just kind of what I do. I, I try to, again, put it on the patient. You know, if this is somebody who's no kind of person, then I may not do it. I must get the CA125s and nothing else, even though it wasn't elevated before. You know, because I don't have any proof it's going to be better for them for me to know it anyway. Um, and, you know, you've got your young patient that's really hypervigilant. And you don't want, you know, I've had a young patient who, I don't remember why she had a CT, but it wasn't part of my surveillance. And they found her recurrence. And she was like, why wasn't I getting these CAT scans all the time? You know, go to that person and say, well, there's this study by Rustin, you know, that shows your quality of life is going to be worse now that we know, you know, that your asymptomatic cancer is there. So um, it's a, it's a yeah, individualized decision, put it that way. Any other things you didn't bring up? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.